St. Paul says in his letters to the Romans, hope is what saves us, for we are saved by hope. But hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man sees, why does he have hope for it? But if we hope for that which we see not, then do we with patience wait for it? And Emily Dickinson calls hope that thing with feathers that perches on the soul and sings the tune without the words and never stops at all. But hope does stop, doesn't it, friends? It can stop. At least the kind of hope that you can see. There are people here today who know that hope can stop. That hoping and the death of hope can sometimes be the thief of joy. Am I right? And hope stopped for those disciples before they embarked on their journey down that road to Emmaus. Failing to recognize that they were talking to the risen Christ, they reflected on the death of the prophet that they had been so sure was the person to redeem Israel, the person that they had been waiting for only to have their dreams destroyed. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. They crucified him. But we had hoped. We had hoped that he was going to be the one who was going to redeem Israel. We had hoped perhaps the saddest words that ever appear in our scriptures. We had hoped, past tense. We had hoped and now we have none, and so now we journey onward, not knowing where to go or what to do. Biblical scholars say that no one really knows that much about the significance of the place of Emmaus. Not much is written about it. We don't know why two of Jesus' friends were walking there about seven miles from Jerusalem. It's kind of a road to nowhere special. We know that they walked that road in the midst of their grief and in the midst of their despair, sort of aimless, right? Perhaps with not much of a destination in mind. Have you walked that road? The beloved teacher that they had hoped would redeem Israel had died, had been crucified by the Roman authorities just three days before. And they believed his story to be abruptly over, right? Almost as soon as it began. And you can imagine the profound, heart-heavy disappointment they felt as they walked the road to Emmaus, the deep grief, the kind you feel when dreams die. It wasn't just a dear friend and spiritual leaders of theirs who died. It was a dream. Anyone who has lost a job or a significant relationship or an identity of any sort has been on this road. Anyone who has lost someone to death, particularly the death of a child, has been on this road. Do you know this road? <clears throat> Do you remember the day your hope stopped? Anyone who has loved and lost has been on this road, this road to nowhere in particular, this road of confusing, confounding grief, the I thought this time was going to be different, but I guess I'll go home road, the I don't know where else to go, so I'll just walk road, the God has abandoned me and I walk this road alone road, the what is the point of living when there is no hope for the world road, even the there is no God road. 
And the disciples, right, they fail to even notice that they are walking with and talking with the risen Christ, that he's with them. And those of us who have felt grief like this, we know what that's like too. Am I right? It's hard. It's hard to feel God's presence in the midst of our worst suffering. In fact, many of us feel God's absence in those moments. I know many people who stopped putting their faith in God altogether in those moments. People who lost God altogether and never found God again. Do you know those people? So these guys are so consumed with their own hopelessness that they fail to see God in their path. And who can blame them? Who can blame them? It's so easy to see God in the sunset or in a Super Bowl win, right? But when the world goes dark and you are confronted with the worst of human violence and terror, it's pretty hard to believe that God's still around or that God was ever even around to begin with. When I was pretty young, in my 20s, I decided that the world was both worth saving and savable, as people in their 20s do, right? And I decided to go to graduate school and be a mental health counselor because I decided that counseling kids would be my way of saving the world. Like those disciples, I had hoped. I had hoped that I was going to really make a difference in the lives of traumatized children, and I knew how I was going to do it. And upon graduating, I decided to work in residential treatment. Have any of you ever worked in residential treatment? Has, have any of you ever worked as counselors? Raise your hands. You can, you can interact with me. I know I'm high up here. <laughs> yeah. So I took a job at the Home for Little Wanderers, which is a social service agency in Boston. Some of you might be familiar with it. It's huge, right? And I listened in that one year to so many stories of human evil in that place as a counselor. And I worked with kids who had been tortured and sexually abused and neglected to the point of starvation and failure to thrive. And I worked within systems that were so broken and hopeless. Do you know those systems? No one believed that these kids would ever be able to live outside of an institution, right? They would graduate, and then they would likely end up in jail. And I was only there for a year, and those kids' stories seeped into my own story. Perhaps you know how that happens, too. Do you know how that happens? when people's stories actually just become yours to hold, and you hold them heavy. In psychology, we actually have a fancy term for it. We call it vicarious traumatization. And I lost some hope during that time. I lost a lot of hope during that time, at least the hope that I could see, right? I became rather cynical for someone under the age of 30. I know because my jokes were darker than usual, like the kinds of jokes that you tell at parties where people don't know whether to laugh or commit you to an institution. <laughs> I thought I was funny. <laughs> when I took the bus into the neighborhood I worked in, all I saw was pain and sorrow on the faces around me, everything. Everywhere I went was just gray and kind of dark. The world had lost color. Do you know what this is like when the world loses color? It's a feeling that makes it hard to see God in your path, right? I was so busy thinking about what I had hoped, what I had hoped for the world, that I didn't see anything godly left in it. And anyone who has ever lived with depression knows this gray, empty, bleak space well. You give yourself over to indifference, to lack of feeling. Not feelings of sadness, but no feelings at all. 
You walk your old road sort of shuffling around, unable to see or to sense God walking beside you. You had hoped, but that's over now. You fail to see any sort of resurrection. Even spring fails to dazzle you. You're too numb to notice or to frankly even care. And yet, this imagination-less, bleak, grief place is often, strangely, where we find God. Where the hope we didn't know was still perching on our souls like a feather and never stops at all actually emerges. This dark place is actually where I found a glimmer of my call to the ministry again where I found God in my path in that sad, cynical, weird, jokey, dark, angry space I had gotten myself into when the world was split into victims and victimizers. I found there, in that place, that I was meant for a different road. I knew that I had forgotten how to love the world, and I knew I needed to bring hope and to be hope to other people. And I knew somehow that that was going to be in the everyday life of the church because our job is hope-bringing, my friends, is it not? We are a hope-bringing people. Can I get an amen? Amen. Thank you. You're catching on. (laughs) Thank God for the choir, right? And that, my friends, is what I love about the Road to Emmaus story. They finally sit down. Jesus serves them bread. He serves them a meal. And in breaking that bread together, they are finally able to see God sitting with them, God before them, God with them, God among them. They say, aha, it's him. It was him all along, duh, right? That's not in the scripture, but that's what they were saying, duh. How did we not notice before? How did we not notice before? He gives the disciples bread and pours them wine, and they recognize God at last in this simple and this life-changing and this life-giving act. Have you recognized God this way in the breaking of that bread, in seeing each other in church? We can even find God in church. Did you know that? (laughs) That's church. That's church. That's our reminder of the living God among us. That is church. Can I get an amen? Amen. And that is why we keep coming back to this place, to each other, to this table, to this table of love and justice and welcome and kindness and goodness. We are each other's reminders of God, my friends, because we need those reminders every day of our week, don't we? Our job is to be God's welcome, God's song, God's hands, God's feet. God's bread and wine, God's life and God's hope. God's welcome and God's welcome back to each other. And our dashed hopes will continue to mask God in our path. And so we need one another as reminders. We are hope bringers. Ask the search committee. Have you talked to the search committee lately? Do you know your pastoral search committee? They are awesome. Am I right? Am I right? Yes. Yes. They had hoped. They had hoped a lot. (laughs) And for a long time, and from the very beginning, that they would find you the perfect pastor. As if there's any such thing, right? They had over a hundred applicants for this position, and this fantastic group of people read reams of paperwork. I don't think you could even believe the amount of paperwork, and they met with lots of great pastors and listened to, oh, about a million sermons. Yeah, 
Vicky just said at least. There were probably more. I joked with them that they must have been looking for the Mary Poppins of ministers for you, right? If you want this choice position, have a cheery disposition, right? Rosy cheeks, no warts, play games, all sorts. I'm sure they felt at many times on this journey that their high hopes could rob them of an opportunity to see God or to see where God was leading them. Because hopes can do that, right? They can put you off the path, can't they? And truthfully, I was looking for the Mary Poppins of churches. And I think I found you, right? <laughs> the Julie Andrews of churches. Sterling, First Church in Sterling. I had hoped that I would find the perfect congregation at first, at first, that was Christian and Unitarian Universalist and theologically diverse and exactly 10 minutes from my husband's work at Boston University. <laughs> and have a cheery disposition, right? <laughs> so God couldn't possibly be calling me anywhere outside of the metro Boston area, right? God keeps me in one very small place. I could... I knew that. And certainly not to a small town where there are surely insects. God couldn't possibly want me to be inconvenienced or want me to live in a bucolic setting with no H&M. Do you have an H&M around here? No. You don't even know what that is, see? <laughs> like, where am I going to get my hair done, you know? So our, our hopes can rob us of our ability to see God in our path, to know where God is leading us. God was leading me here, and I didn't see it at first. I didn't. And I'm sure these past few weeks have seen a little past tense hoping on your part as well, right? I'm sure there are so many things you had hoped for in a minister, had hoped for in a minister that may that may not be true of me, right? Maybe you had hoped that I would be uh, UCC. Or maybe you had hoped I would have a beard. <laughs> Ministers always look better with beards, right? <laughs> and maybe you had hoped I would be older or younger or shorter, right? Or maybe you had hoped I would be more interesting or less interesting or... <laughs> more serious or less serious or more experienced or less experienced and maybe you had hoped I'd be conservative or more conservative or less conservative. Maybe you had hoped that I would be more like your last minister or less like your last minister. Our hopes can be an obfuscation of God's dream for us because I think we are all exactly where we are supposed to be today. That's what I think. I hope you think so, too. I am and you are. And I can promise you this, okay? I can promise you that I will probably dash your hopes more if I am lucky enough to be called as your minister today. And I'll dash those hopes after the, last, the next many years, and I'm pretty sure you'll probably dash mine a few times, too. But I promise, I promise that I will do my very human best to humbly serve our God and to invite you to serve our God with me. We will fail a lot. We will. And we will make each other really mad. And that's how we know we, will, we are doing it right. And we will also do some beautiful things together. Some beautiful, loving, hopeful things. Hope bringers all. The amazing thing about this ministry is that all of us are perfectly imperfect people here in this room, cheery dispositions or not. We are all going to help one another get to the heart of God together because that's our superpower, my friends. That's our call. It's to be church to one another, 
to be each other's hope for the world, and we are going to do that by showing up every week, by inviting one another to this table of welcome and love every time we come back, and we are going to frequently mess up, and we're going to ask for forgiveness, and we are going to offer it and we are going to find the people who are numbly and aimlessly and desperately walking their roads to Emmaus, which at any point in time will be every one of us. And we are going to show to each other God's presence by showing each other our presence. We are going to break bread and we're going to pour wine and remember together why we are here and who calls us here. A beloved hymn in my Unitarian Universalist hymnal says, I'll bring you hope when hope is hard to find and I'll bring a song of love and a rose in the wintertime. And if I have the great privilege of being your minister, that is what I will endeavor to do. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to walk with you. Amen.